show that we're supposed to be starting off? Not old enough audience? <laughs> yes, Battlestar Galactica. Exactly right. The original Battlestar Galactica with head with Lauren Green. It's back in 1979, even though this was past the high point of popularity of the idea. And of course it's been reintroduced in the new form as well. So all <laughs> popular ideas Widespread, we've all heard of them one way or another, but we still have to ask, is it real or is it a very entertaining fiction? I want to know if it's true. If it's true, it's amazingly awesome. It's something that I would want to believe if it is true. Of course, we have to then ask, who can actually show it's true? What sort of evidences are provided? And this is where we then step in, probably the first person to really popularize the idea as a hypothesis the Swiss hotelier Eric von Daniken. Uh, yeah, he was grew up in Switzerland. He made a fair bit of money while he was working as a hotel manager. And while he was there, he did some nice things such as embezzling money. So that way he could run trips <coughs> around the world, which he then claimed that he used to research his very famous book, Chariots of the Gods. Uh, this cover claims uh, this is uh, after selling, selling 7 million copies of this book. Uh, Estimates now are closer to over 20 million copies and over 60 million of all his books together. It's the most widely sold history book of all time. <laughs> that should make you bad. <laughs> and of course, way beyond anything in archaeology. So, a bit of history on him. Like I said, he, he was the big person who popularized this. He wrote this book back in 1968 in German, was translated into English in 1970 71, serialized in the great. National Enquirer at the Bastion of Truth. 
<laughs> and this then became really big. Uh, Rob Sterling helped promote it, the same person who produced um, the, uh, the Twilight Zone. He helped push that as well. But the things got quite discredited back in the later 70s. There were various books that had come out. I have one of those there, this one from Guy Blaney and Ronald's story that was basically tearing apart his arguments. If you can get a copy, it's good because it also has a four by Carl Sagan. And also interestingly, there was Neil Armstrong who actually helped take down uh, the claims of Von Dantin. I'll talk about that a little bit. And there was also a documentary that was put out by PB, uh, PBS Nova and BBC Horizon back in 78, 77. Um, that one's actually really hard to find now, but I did find a VHS copy and I put it up on YouTube, so if you want to go look for that. A bit out of date because it's from the 70s, but it still shows some of the problems that he had. And even though this was pretty much discredited by the end of the 70s, during the 80s it wasn't really talked about, but it's been getting resurrected in popularity, most noticeably on the History Channel, and of course he's had a very enthusiastic young acolyte, um, Giorgio Sucolos. Um, He's, um, he's not a hotelier like Von Daniken. His background is uh, in um, sports communication, especially in promoting bodybuilding. So um, he's not a historian, but he has a lot of um, uh, love for the subject, let's say, even though he may not know how to do it. So what sorts of claims do these guys make? Big thing they look at in more ways than one are the big megalithic structures all around the world, such as the Giza pyramids, um, Stonehenge, etc., etc., all these large monuments that they think that there's no way primitive humans could have done. What they mean by primitive is a little bit odd. It seems like they're talking about Stone Age people, but as I'll show, none of these things are really Stone Age tech things. Uh, they'll also look at some unusual artifacts. It might be some artwork that looks strange and they think it looks like um, an alien of some sort. It might be some piece of technology that seems out of place. They'll also look at the various myths. Uh, myths, whether it be Arabian Nights or even the Bible. And interesting thing, uh, a lot of these same evidences are used to try to prove not aliens, but some sort of Atlantis-like um, tradition, which also has its claims going all the way back to the 19th century. So let's take a look at how we can sum up their methodology rather quickly. You'll notice that they'll do a lot of, well, it's possible that, or couldn't it be possible if it's always some sort of um, question format that is being presented, rather than here's all the evidence why aliens over anything else. So it's actually summed up quite well memetically, as you might have seen this. Uh, yes, Mr. Sukulos there. Um, so he's not saying it, but he's really saying it anyways, trying to reply to innuendo. And I want to show today that uh, no, it's it's not. The hypothesis should be dead. They're just trying to make it look alike. Right, Chuck? All right, so let's take a look at one of their big claims. This is the one that pretty much all ancient astronaut people jump to, and Atlantis people jump to. They look at the Egyptian pyramids. Great Pyramid of Giza, one of the eight wonders of the world, the only one still standing. And it's massive, and they're like, well, this just popped out of nowhere. There seems to be no prior tradition. So how do we go from people you know, living on the Serengeti to all of a sudden we're building giant monuments? Well, in the same way, like creationists, they don't seem to be aware of the transi transitional forms. We can basically watch, through Egyptian history, over centuries, the development of different burial techniques. First, just starting with just a, you know, just a pile of dirt until you finally have the uh, matzava, which they buried into their first pharaohs, along with some of their um, other assistants at the time. They stopped doing that afterwards because when you have to kill the entire bureaucracy every time the pharaoh dies, it's kind of a headache, paperwork-wise. So they stopped doing that for a bit. Then the simple idea is start stacking up these matzibas and you get the step pyramid design. Uh, we've seen some, many of these, and again, centuries before the really big pyramids. And there's intermediate forms such as the bent pyramid before we get to the great one. So this is over centuries. This is not out of nowhere giant monolith. Uh, to detail a little bit, uh, here's we can see the development quite well. This is a attempt at building one of the pyramids uh, called uh, the Medum Pyramid. It was attempted to be completed under Pharaoh uh, Sine uh, Sineferu, who was the founder of the Fourth Dynasty. And as you can see, it's a bit of a mess because it most likely collapsed during construction. Uh, it had some issues, for example, the outer wall wasn't built on top of rock, but on top of sand. You can also see like some of the layers are limestone, some of them are mud brick, so this isn't a very sturdy design. 
But you could also see the sort of step design as well. They're building right on top of that step design, which had already existed at least a century earlier. So Sefford did, you know, like this. He wanted to have his, you know, his proper burial tomb, not in pieces. So his team tried again, and they built this pyramid known as the Bent Pyramid. And the reason it's bent was because of issues with the construction. So you can see, for example, the rocks are kind of sloppily put together. They're not all nicely shaped. And it just couldn't hold the weight up. So midway during construction, they had to change the angles so the thing wouldn't collapse like the medium pyramid. So these are guys that are going to trial and error over decades. And then, again, Sefford doesn't like this, and so he builds another one. And this is not the Great Pyramid, but this is the Red Pyramid, not on the Giza Plateau. It's a pretty good sized one, and as you can see, it actually held up. So it's almost like that Monty Python bit. You know, first, uh, sw uh, first castle sank into the swamp, then I built another one. That one sank too. Third one, lit on fire, then sank. But the fourth one, <laughs> that's pretty much what's going on here. After several attempts, they finally get something that works. And then finally, the successor and son of Sneferu comes along, the great Khufu, and we have then the Great Pyramid. Now, a lot of the ancient astronaut people are going to try to claim Khufu wasn't responsible for it, or it was helped with aliens, or it was built thousands of years earlier. But there's things that show really who's, you know, who's driving things. We have, for example, historical traditions like Herodotus and Egyptian tradition that it goes back to Khufu. And the traditional name of the pyramid is Khufu's Horizon. Uh, alien horizon, for example. We have dating methods. We can look at the work sites. We can look at the stratigraphy and see when they were doing things. We can carbon date items. And again, they fit the time of Khufu. Um, also, the interesting thing is these shafts that go through the pyramids that seem to point to particular stars that would have been very important, especially the circumpolar stars. They believe that those were stars of immortality because they never set. And those stars kind of drift because of a process known as precession, because the Earth kind of wobbles like a top. So if you then align those shafts to where the stars were, you go again back to the time of Pharaoh Khufu. And if that's not enough, there's graffiti with his name on it. <laughs> this was actually left not by Khufu, but actually by some of the workers who basically said, this put up in the 17th year of Khufu by the Friends of Khufu. That was the name of the workforce. Uh, this was discovered in 1837 when they used dynamite to get to this um, hidden spot in the pyramid. They used dynamite. Archaeology wasn't that great back in 1837. And quite literally found his name. It should be a done deal at this point. So we can be really certain about where this pyramid goes along, that it was built by humans who wrote on it, and they're definitely not saying, and through the help of space aliens. But these are the only pyramids in the world. We literally find pyramid-like structures all over the place, in Mesoamerica, in Mesopotamia, in China, in Greece. Why are they all over the place? Is this a sign of a monoculture of aliens popping around building pyramids everywhere? It doesn't seem so well because all these pyramids are significantly different. The, these are ones, these are tombs. Uh, the Maya or Aztec pyramids, those ones are actually built for like presentation, where you do like basically some sort of effect theater, usually with blood, at the top of these. The ziggurats of Babylon, again, very different. But these really shouldn't be a signs of some great superculture because the thing they all have in uh, common is that they're a sloping pile, which is the only large structure you can build without reinforcing materials like iron or steel. This is the limit of Bronze Age technology. That's why they're all over the place. It's the only big thing you can build until you get better technology. This shouldn't be a sign of aliens. It should be a sign of people. But Unfortunately, that hasn't quite sunk in for the opponents that I'm talking about today. Of course, again, they always seem to be going with, is it possible that it's this, possible that it's that? But then they don't try to give a consistent theory, which I can show with these two examples. There is the famous Nazca Lines of Peru, about 400 miles south of the uh, city of Lima. And there are these large lines that are etched into the ground by moving away some of the uh, topsoil, basically. And Von Daniken claimed back in the 60s, and still claims to some degree, that these were basically airport lines. That these are for takeoff and landing, one way or another. Uh, a little bit hard to do because the surface is gypsum and sand, and so if you try driving across it, you get stuck. Uh, also, a lot of these lines go into mountains, so bumpy ride, to say the least. They also crisscross, so this is the worst airport. Um, but still, they also then looked at these stones at the town of Baalbek, which is in modern-day Syria, uh, after Alexander the Great is called um, Heliopolis. 
and have these giant stones. Uh, the stones here in the temple walls are over 800 tons, and big stones like this one here, uh, known as the stone of the pregnant woman, is over 1,200 tons. And then they claim, well, these are used as landing pads, which is a little bit odd. Do they need vertical takeoff or horizontal takeoff? Are they just going to say anything and everything? No, they're not even trying to make a consistent theory. They're just saying, is it possible? Is that possible? Nonetheless, though, those are some big rocks. How the heck do you move things of such magnitude without any great technology? Uh, just tie a bunch of ropes and pole? That's going to be pretty hard. It's really hard to lift a 1,200-ton rock up to the Temple Mount, which is why the Romans didn't do that. The quarry site, where this one is at, is actually at a higher elevation than where the Temple is. You don't push up, you push down. So the Romans, they were a little bit smarter than that. And how else do you move these things? It's still you know, a pretty big object. Best thing you can do is put a wheel on it. This is based on the uh, designs that are talked about by the uh, first century BC Roman architect Vitruvius. And basically the idea is you're ultimately putting like a wooden wheel around the square shaped pillars of those sort. And now you can easily pull it along with a few pack animals. The resistance goes down significantly and it's not that hard to pull along. Still, you get it to the site, but you still need to now drag it into place. Again, does that need a huge workforce? Well, with a little bit of work, the Romans had an idea of mechanical advantage. So we have all these people that are basically going to be pushing around and getting um, mechanical leverage by doing that. So if you see, for example, Conan the Barbarian in the early on where he's pushing around this giant coffee grinder or whatever the heck it is, pretty much that. You put 12 people on each one of these things, you put a dozen of them together, and you can move these 800 ton stones. So it's estimated that you can move this stone not with thousands of workers, but about 144. Days of slave labor, that's not too bad. So again, we don't need aliens to explain this. And we can still, of course, see that you know this is Roman technology, and we can see how it's advanced compared to Egyptian technology, where it's just <coughs> put it on a sled and pull it, quite literally. Uh, so this is supposed to be a structure that the Egyptians drew and show. It's just a bunch of people with ropes. Uh, with a like several hundred ton statue that they're pulling along and one guy pouring a lubricant right in front either probably water or milk or perhaps some sort of oil to minimize the friction and that's how they can move these things around just a sled and a bunch of people pulling again as you can see no aliens so again we don't need these sorts of things to try to explain amazing accomplishments by a lot of willpower and some forethought on the part of the engineers, especially the Roman engineers. Now, another piece of technology is quite interesting, um, and I want to show how it's presented in the show Ancient Aliens, so that way you can see I'm not going to completely strong man. Often described as the world's first mechanical computer, it dates back over 2,000 years. The Antikythera device was found in 1900 by sponge divers diving off a, a small island in the Aegean called Antikythera. There was a shipwreck there, and in it was a coral-encrusted box, and it was made of metal alloys, and it then went to the Athens Museum, where a good 50 years later, they were able to x-ray this box, and they were able to discern cogged wheels that were interconnected, and give us a very good depiction of what this thing was. And it is a computer. It's a really sophisticated machine. It's a very interesting piece of technology because it served two purposes. One was that it was an astronomical device where you could, by using it, chart your position to the stars and navigate your way through the seas. It was also an astrological device so that someone could tell you Ah, if you were born on this date, and your planet sign is this, then certain things are going to happen to you when the planets are in this alignment. So it was a very interesting piece of technology that literally had more complicated gears and inner workings than a modern day Swiss watch. And it's found to be dated, I think, like 200 BC, so it's really an anomaly as to who could have created that and what it was being used for. When archaeologists first started to examine this thing in the 1950s, they said that they never could conceive of the ancient 
Greeks having such complicated machinery. And in fact, they said this was tantamount to finding a jet airplane in the tomb of King Tut. Okay, so the Antikythera mechanism, what is it actually? It actually is a mechanical computer. It is a fascinating device. And it dates from somewhere in the early first century BC, somewhere like in the 80s or 90s BC. Uh, it was found like say, in a shipwreck, and it actually does tell you like the locations of the sun, the moon, cross, and probably the planets as well. Uh, who made it? Well, they're trying to make it sound mysterious, but the thing is we're kind of told by Cicero, uh, first century BC uh, politician, who basically said, oh, they, you know, talked about some of the things that his tutor, Posidonius of Rhodes, had built, and the things he described sound a lot like the something like the Antikythera mechanism. So we don't have to wonder who did it, we're told. We can also see the dating of it, uh, that it's from that time period. Uh, and there's actually some reasonable speculation that this idea, this sort of construction, goes all the way back to Archimedes. It may not have been as sophisticated as the one we found, but there's some indications that it might actually go back to the great Archimedes of Syracuse. Uh, it's not useful for navigation because, you know, our rocket ship, you need to know exactly what time it is to wind it correctly. Uh, rust on these sorts of metals is not great, so that's not really a great strategy. If you want to know your position with latitude, you look at the sun, and that's a much faster, easier way to do it. And the thing that kind of gives away that this probably is an alien tech, other than the fact why are aliens building mechanical computers instead of electronic ones, is the sort of gearing it uses called epicyclic, uh, epicyclic gearing. It's the sort of gearing that you'll still find today in uh, pencil sharpeners. And it's based on the idea of epicycles, first proposed by uh, Apollonius of Perga, 3rd, 4th century BC. Uh, epicycles were used to try to explain the, heli or the geocentric model of the universe. This is doing a geocentric model. We would think if they were getting alien tech, they would at least know something about the geometry, the way the solar system actually works, instead of using a method that we know is wrong. And of course, you have all the errors that creep into a mechanical device. You can't get everything as accurate as you can with a computer. We know the technology that goes into it. It actually does fit what we know about this time. 50 years ago, we weren't so certain because 50 years ago, we didn't really even have a great history of science program until about basically the 50s or 60s. But now it makes sense. Aliens need not apply. If you want to learn about the history, this book here, Decoding the Heavens, is fantastic. It reads like a novel, but it, unlike Danica, it's actually true. So, let's move on to some other artifacts of the point two. These ones aren't so real. Uh, for example, you might have heard of the Ica stones. These are used a lot by creationists because they show humans and dinosaurs living together. Oh, well, that can't happen. That, that says evolution says that's false, so that's why they're excited about it. But it's supposed to show all sorts of other alien tech and things like that. <coughs> and, you know, Von Denica says, hey, look at this, you know, alien proof. But we happen to know they're fake because we, we have interviewed the guy who made them recorded interviews, talking with him, uh, going through the process of how to make them, cutting them up and see that, yeah, these are pretty much just made for tourists. And one guy in that area in South America just got excited and thought he could, you know, just prove everything with it. Von Denneken himself was told about this, and basically his informant basically said, no, that guy's just a liar, or the person who claims he's making the artifacts, he's just lying. Even though the person who was saying he was lying um, had written a thank you letter for the artifacts, getting it from him. So the faker of the artifacts had a letter that said, thank you for giving this to me, and then claiming, oh, he's a liar about where they actually come from. It's it's unfortunately truly fake, and even most creationists won't even jump on these anymore, except for like Ken Colvin. But he's in jail, so what do you expect? The real thing where things get interesting is in another book that Von Dedekin wrote called Gold of the Gods, where he claimed he went down to Ecuador, went to this cave that he was led to that was supposed to have been hollowed out with, by artificial means. He thought they were uh, hollowed out by lasers. And inside there were all sorts of gold artifacts from all over the world showing books of gold and other things, trying to show all sorts of alien tech. And you know, this is fantastic, awesome, show us the cave. Well, unfortunately he did lots of, you know, hemming and hawing to not do that. So an expedition went down that was um, led in part by the great Neil Armstrong went down to Ecuador and said, we can't find your cave. Every cave around that area you talked about is naturally formed. There's no gold, let alone alien gold. And eventually as time went on, Von Denikin said, well, I added things to you know, make it more dramatic. 
which is another word saying, I lied, but it's because I don't care. He's just saying, you know, that's what he's allowed to do. He's not, he's making a popular book so he can make shit up. Yeah. And eventually, you know, this was completely discredited. And one of the things that really brought down his credibility, along with that NOAA documentary I mentioned. Now, artifacts aren't the only thing they'll go for. They'll also try to reinterpret some ancient stories. This one I gotta talk about because I've been studying the Star of Bethlehem theories for a long time. And again, here's how they present the story. During his life, researchers believe Antiochus studied with a priestly sect of Eastern astrologers called the Magi, who were thought to be able to predict and even manipulate events based on their knowledge of the stars. The Magi were renowned priests from the far Near East who had advanced astronomical knowledge. And it's well known that most of the astronomers from the Near East, specifically ancient Iraq, Sumer, recorded series of events happening in the heavens over hundreds of thousands of years. This information was kept on stone tablets, held very sacredly, and only passed down to the high priests. According to the Gospel of Matthew in the New Testament, it was three of these magi who followed celestial signs and stars to the birthplace of Jesus in Bethlehem. A coincidence? What's interesting about this story is that the Star of Bethlehem wasn't used as a navigation point. It is clearly stated as it guided the wise men to the place of Christ. A star cannot guide someone. It can only be used as a navigation point. So this brings up the idea that the star was possibly a UFO. <laughs> Today, we think that the Magi were magicians. And that is actually why we have the word magic today. But when I hear about magical powers, that raises a flag because magic as such does not exist. So were these magi in fact in possession of some type of an extraterrestrial technology? Because according to the ancient texts, it was the initiates of each culture who were in touch with extraterrestrials. And it was the initiates who later became priests or magi. Okay, so to sum up, yeah. So, okay, let's see what they get right. The way that it's described in the uh, Gospel of Matthew is that the star is actually guiding them. It's actually the Greek says it guides them basically to where Jesus was hanging out at the time. Uh, of course, the thing is, the book calls it a star, it uses the Greek word for star, not ship or alien spacecraft, so why then think it's that, necessarily? Um, but there's also one little detail that most Bible scholars, you know, would probably also mention that might kind of hurt this, that, you know, it's kind of a story, it's kind of fiction, it's kind of, you know, didn't happen. And, uh, I can go into details of why we know that this is most likely not historically true, but, this is basically the conclusion of Bible scholars for about the last 150 years, um, and they kind of just you know jump past that. Also, some things they mentioned about the Persian Magi that were supposed to have been uh, the teachers to they mentioned Antiochus, uh, who was a king of Commagene at the time. Um, they had not been studying or recording star positions for hundreds of thousands of years. We haven't had writing that long. Kind of hard to record things without the writing system. Uh, the records go back centuries in their time, not tens of thousands of years. Um, also, the Persian Magi, something we also know about them, is that actually they weren't astrologers, not at the time of Jesus. They only got interested in astrology later on, so the tradition that the Tigers were supposed to be part of was Egyptian, not Persian. And also, really, astrology? This is the tech we're getting from the aliens, something that we know doesn't work. Okay, if this is what the aliens are teaching us, they can go home. <laughs> All right. Teaching us things that we know are wrong, not a great strategy. All right. So, a few more ancient stories. Another one from the Bible, the vision of Ezekiel. There's been books called literally uh, uh, about Ezekiel and calling his vision with his encounter with an alien spacecraft. Uh, it's really messed up. It's talking about like a, a person that has four heads. One is a human, one is an eagle, one is a bull, things like that. Uh, 
with sets of wings, and then these rings that are uh, intersecting each other that are covered in eyes. Really freaky. And even the Masoretic text, the Hebrew uh, copy that we have of it, even like the grammar is messed up because nobody could really figure out what's the right way to write this down. It's so weird a vision. But we can understand it when we put it in the context of Jewish and Babylonian iconography and astrology. So the four different heads that I mentioned, those are corresponding to constellations in the Babylonian zodiac that would be where you have the solstices and equinoxes. So for example, Taurus the bull, so you have the bull head. Uh, the rings then, the, um, the, they're covered in eyes. The Hebrew word ayin or ayinin for the plural can also mean like a brightness. And also it said that the other creatures are covered in eyes as well. And it seems like the best interpretation is that they're basically saying they're covered in stars. So we have constellations covered in stars. They move around east to west, north to south. This looks like it's basically using astronomical, astrological um, imagery, not alien spacecraft. And what kind of really gives it away is when they talk about like the, uh, the rocky of the um, firmament, the dome that's above all of them. This dome idea comes from flat earth cosmogonies cosmographies that there's this giant dome that um, holds out all the water that opens up to let in rain onto the flat earth. So if Ezekiel's getting visitations from aliens, they're not te teaching him some very basic things about the shape of the earth. Instead, he's assuming the sorts of things that were believed at the time he's writing in the 6th century BC, flat earth, sky dome. This is not what I expect from aliens. But one more kicker, uh, this one comes from Arabian Nights, the story that probably many people know about Ali Baba and the 40 Thieves. Thieves have this one cave, and the only way you can open it up is going to the uh, rock and saying, open sesame, and then it moves out of the way. Vondanikin looks at this and says, ah, voice recognition technology opening the door. <laughs> yeah, okay, so not even considering it's a fiction or not, you know, you know, this might be just an old story or something like that, I think it's kind of know something else about the story that kind of hurts its credibility. Um, it's from the 18th century, and it was written in French originally by uh, Antoine Garret, uh, uh, sorry, Antoine Garret, and so yeah, it's a fake. <laughs> and this is his evidence that he jumps to, but we know, we've known for a long time, it's a made up story by a Frenchman who originally had brought the Arabian Night stories to Europe and made it really big. Right, Senator so Greenback? Yes. Okay, so not all the things <coughs> I want to deal with are from Von Daniken, there's also some ones that deal with one of the most ancient civilizations, the Sumerians, who uh, existed one way or another over a rather long period of time and did some pretty amazing innovations. They worked on the wheel originally, they made like one of the first writing systems, the first written set of laws, some mathematics. Uh, you know, they made some pretty impressive advancements, though of course over centuries or millennia, so it doesn't look like a giant boom in knowledge. But where things get interesting is where uh, this person, Zechariah Sitchin, comes along. He's not a historian by training, but he said that he had learned how to translate the Sumerian text at a time when very few uh, could do that, even very few academics could do it. And the things he was claiming he could read about there was that there was this race of beings known as the Anunnaki, who lived on the planet Nibiru. And you may have been hearing about this recently as well. This planet was supposed to be on a 3600 year um, orbit. It's highly elliptical, so it goes well with <coughs> Pluto when it comes back. And they, uh, the aliens are saying they're going to come back, and they'll be coming back in 2012. Armageddon. <laughs> yes. Okay, you can see I'm here. All right, so the problem is, is pretty much all the stuff he was dealing with was focusing on this particular um, artifact and bit of writing that was left by the Sumerians and trying to interpret that to mean all sorts of things where he said, oh, according to this star map on there, there are actually 12 planets, the sun and the moon count as planets, and so that only counts for 11 once you have up to Pluto, so there must be this 12th planet, and that's Nibiru. Uh, if that star map thing looks a little bit familiar, maybe because you recently saw Prometheus, I get the feeling they might have gotten the idea from Sitchin's work. But things we do know about them from other records, you know, from the people who actually can read the Sumerian, is that this is not a particular this is not a demonstration of the solar system because that's not the sun. This six-pointed star is not the sun. This is how they were depicted with four um, four rays coming out and then a bunch of squiggly lines. This is a very stable iconography all the way in very ancient uh, Sumeria, even into Greek times, even makes it on Greek coinage. There's no mistaking between the star and the sun. 
And all the other little dots, those are just stars as well. It's probably a constellation. Uh, he also gets things messed up when he uh, says a particular Anunnaki to a star. But somehow Venus is not associated with Ishtar, which is also something way back in Sumerian mythology. It might even be before the written language associating the goddess Ishtar or Inanna with Venus. But he doesn't make that connection, so he really botched that up. Oh, and Nibiru is not a planet. It is a term that is an aspect of a planet at a certain time of year, when it's at its high point on the um, elliptic, uh, the ecliptic, uh, when the Earth is going around the sun, where everything looks like it's kind of shifted up in the sky. So sometimes it says Jupiter is in the Nibiru condition, or Mercury is. It's not its own planet. And, oh, we also have these things called telescopes. We can look. There is not a large trans-Neptunian planet out there, not four times the size of Earth as he was claiming. So no worries about 2012 because of this. Sorry, it's pretty much wrong back to front. OK. Now, all these ideas didn't you know, pop out of nowhere. It's, we wanted to actually find out where did these things come from. Was it just one very fertile imagination who thought you know, he was reading evidence strangely? In fact, we can actually track it down very well, and we can track it down to a rather famous individual, H.P. Lovecraft, most famous for the Cthulhu mythos. That we can actually see that basically stories like the Call of Cthulhu at the Mountains of Madness basically took old ideas about like an Atlantis civilization, but added aliens. This became then very popular in post-war France, and then a bunch of people thought that um, H.P. Lovecraft was actually just hiding the knowledge. He wrote it in fiction, but it was all actually really true. And these things were then turned to books such as um, The Morning of the Magicians, that then made it to Von Daniken, which then he popularized, even though he didn't tell what his sources were. So he's also plagiarized. Uh, this case is actually made very well by um, Jason, uh, Jason Colavido, uh, Colavido, this book here. Uh, if you want to grab this copy, I have as well, or if you want to order it online, it's really good. You'll learn a lot about both literature and history and pseudo-history. Very entertaining. I liked it very much. Five stars. Go get it. This person also has been devoting a lot of time. He's also written the unauthorized uh, critical companion to seasons three and four of Ancient Aliens. So he did the suffering for you. Uh, you can get that in Lulu if you want. And like I said, this sort of stuff was even going on during the time of, <clears throat> of H.P. Lovecraft. People were claiming you know, what he was writing was actually real. When he made up the Necronomicon, everyone was asking him, where can I get a copy of this book? I made it up. So even at that time, he was you know, calling this childishness, and he didn't want to deal with it anymore. It was already annoying back then while he was alive, let alone before it got to Vaughan. So these methods aren't working. We're just finding lots of misinformation, bad history. We need to try a different method. Let's try something that we know actually can work that might actually help us find extraterrestrials. And the program has probably been at the forefront of that when it comes to finding intelligent ones is the SETI program, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, using whether it be very large telescopes like this one down in Puerto Rico, the Arecibo telescope. Uh, there's also this signal here, which has been a popular candidate for an alien signal called the WOW signal. It was actually um, first researched here at Ohio State. Uh, it hasn't been reproduced, so it's really hard to know what actually caused that. But it's been getting a lot of people interested, and we've been doing these study searches for a while now. How does it work? Well, all you need basically is a bunch of radio telescopes, a bunch of computers to process the data, and you could also use some chatting aliens who are willing to talk to us. Uh, the process is a little bit different than like what it's shown like in the movie Contact. For one thing, Jody Foster here just listening with her headphones. Um, that's not going to work so well because they um, listen to 8 million channels at a given time. So she's going to need a lot more headphones, for one thing. Uh, and also, they're not going to be listening for prime numbers or things like that. They're actually, if we get an alien signal, we won't be able to read it. It's not because it's encrypted. Uh, it's because basically we don't have the resolution to read a signal after it's been so badly diluted traveling through, through many light years of space. But what we can look at is basically the bandwidth, how much of a spike in the signal we get. Because this is a sign of artificiality. Pretty much everything else in nature has a rather broad bandwidth. Uh, most of the stars, for example, cover the entire electromagnetic spectrum to one degree or another. So you get this spike. That's a sign of artificiality. You do some work to make sure that it's actually um, external and not like a military satellite or something like that. And that's the basic process they go through. And of course, you can't look at the whole sky. 
at one time. You can't look at all radio wavelengths at one time. So they concentrate in this region that's been called the water hole. This is a point in space where it's rather quiet in the radio spectrum. And you have these two peaks. One is a hydrogen line and one is an OH line. And of course, these are the constitutes of water. You have literally H2O. Life pretty much depends on water. So if there's going to be alien signals, this would be the best place to look because of its uh, proximity to water signals and because it's relatively quiet. So this is where the stuff like SETI at home, for example, that's the frequency range they're usually looking around at. And here's a set of some of the telescopes they're actually using up in Northern California. This is part of the Allen Telescope Array. These are six meter wide uh, dishes. There's currently 42 of them, that is on purpose. They hope to plan though to have several hundred if they have the funding. And of course, in the meantime, all their funding is donation. They get actually no direct support from Congress. That was actually cut back in the early 90s when they tried to for just a matter of months or a year. And otherwise, though, they have lots of other help come in, such as this class of um, ROU students, undergrad students, help. Uh, the woman out of the far right, that's Jill Tarter, one of the big founding figures in SETI, who unfortunately just recently retired, but has basically put in decades of work into it. And there's some person sitting at her feet that I guess does SETI stuff too sometimes. Okay. So they have an approach. They have a way of what they want to do, what a signal would look like. They have an actual scientific approach. They have a hypothesis. But it's got its problems. First off, space is big. When I say space, I'm just talking the galaxy. They're not even trying to listen to anything from Andromeda too far away to even consider. So they're just looking locally. Uh, if there's literally a thousand civilizations right now, technological civilizations in the galaxy, they could be hundreds or thousands of light years away. The Milky Way is over a hundred thousand light years across. It's a big space. So even if there's a bunch of them, they could be really hard to find. Uh, the other problem is that we've actually been seeing is that as we have, our technologies improve, we're using more and more wireless devices and such, but we're actually getting quieter <coughs> in radio. It takes less and less energy to transmit the signals. So the problem is the more technological the aliens get, the harder it will be to hear them rather than the easier. So this really means that if we want to actually communicate with an ET, if we want to know they're out there, they pretty much have to ping us. They have to pretty much send directed signals. To give you an idea of why that is, if you had a transmitter on the opposite side of the Milky Way, giving out enough energy so it could be barely picked up by the ARC or remote telescope down in Puerto Rico, the biggest one we have, the amount of energy required for that radio telescope would be so much it would melt. You can't just send out that uh, energy everywhere. It needs to basically be focused. But that thing is, though, that means that you have to depend on the aliens want to be found. They want to, you know, spread out and let everyone know that they're around. So they need a psychology something like ours. And that's a, that's a pretty significant assumption that they would have any sort of curiosities like we do. And, of course, the civilization actually needs to exist long enough for us to actually receive a signal. And one of the reasons then why this equation is created, the very famous Drake equation. Uh, usually you can put in any number you want, get any answer you want popping out, but as time goes on, we're able to better and better restrict these numbers. For example, the rate of star formation, we have that down pretty well. When it comes to the fraction of stars that have planets around them, we're getting that data better and better all the time with our various <laughs> telescopes. Now it looks to be the point that almost all star systems will have planets. We even uh, have models that say there should be billions of planets going around the solar system without a sun that's attached. So, plenty of those, but other numbers such as the fraction that will produce life, the fraction that will produce intelligent life, the fraction that will produce civilizations that make radio transmitters, and of course the really big one, how long does such civilizations last? We only have one example of that for all these things, us, and we don't know how much longer we're going to last for any number of reasons. I'm optimistic that we're not so stupid to completely destroy ourselves, but, well, there was the Cuban Missile Crisis. We've come close, and who knows what it's like for other civilizations. So as we continue to search, though, even with a null result from SETI, this puts more and more restrictions because they can look at more star systems. Uh, as we look for more planets, we can restrict these numbers and have an estimate that's more and more reasonable. But the thing that will really restrict the life parameters in that equation is if we can find more life forms locally in our solar system. And we have hot spots to look for, even though some of them might be a bit cold. Uh, Mars has, of course, been a big favorite. Uh, whether it's in pseudoscience, where they think they're seeing monuments on Mars, no, that's just a hill, sorry. Or 
where we actually do our scientific things where we're sending probes there because we know that there's water in the poles, we know that there's water underneath the surface every so often that actually puddles over and we can see it with our satellites, only temporarily because liquid water can't survive on the surface of Mars. It actually will just evaporate away. And also, interestingly, the Venusian atmosphere might be a possible candidate. The surface of Venus is terrible. It's super hot, it can melt lead, it's poisonous, it's high pressure, bad day. But if you go up higher into the atmosphere, you get pressures and temperatures that are really similar to that of Earth. So maybe some sort of bacteria form could have uh, come to exist in that environment. It might be a little bit speculative, but it's an avenue that might be worth researching. Uh, and the real big ones perhaps now are the moons. We have, for example, Europa and Enceladus. These ones, we know that there is water coming out of them. Uh, Titan is also quite interesting because it's loaded with hydrocarbons. I'll talk a little bit about that in just a bit. Though you might have heard the most about Mars recently because of the Curiosity rover that landed there. We landed on there with a space crane. Oh, that's awesome. And this thing's big. As you can see from that picture, this is pretty much like the size of a car. It's bigger than any other thing we've sent there. It has a nuclear reactor for running its power rather than solar panels like the old ones did. And it has some awesome equipment. Chemical, cameras, a laser to fire and uh, burrow into rocks. We've actually fired lasers into rocks already. And there's already t-shirts that say, Curiosity shot first. <laughs> Buyers now. And this is going to be you know, a, a long-term mission. It's going to be doing a lot of science. It should be looking for all, not just the geology of Mars and also the climate of Mars, but also to see if there's any interesting compounds, if there's any life forms that it might be able to find. Uh, it won't necessarily be looking at samples with a microscope and saying, oh, there's a bacteria. It'll be looking for other things, such as methane being given off or other chemical signatures of life. Another interesting hotspot is the Saturnian moon of Titan. Uh, the Cassini mission that got there in 2008, I believe, also had a travel companion known as the Huygens probe, which actually went through the atmosphere of Titan and landed on the surface, sniffing the atmosphere as it went along. This place is quite awesome where you see these pictures of lakes. Those aren't lakes of water. Those are lakes of methane and ethane because it's so freakishly cold there. That, that those things that are only gases here are liquefied. Uh, this would be Hank Hill's paradise. Uh, for propane production, but the thing is, it's all hydrocarbon, it's all organic molecule, and we have to wonder if maybe below the surface there might be some heating feature that might actually then be able to again produce something lifelike. We need more research, and one of the planned missions is basically send a blimp there so it can do like a multi-month mission and you know really do a good survey of the place. This is again further research we need to do, but what we really need to look for is water. Water is the big thing that we want to look for if we want to find life with any chance. Preferably in liquid form, and we know places where it actually is that. Uh, this is a picture of a plume of a water jet from Enceladus. It is literally producing water volcanoes, just spinning it out. So we know there's liquid water underneath the surface. Uh, also with Europa, we can, uh, we can actually now detect that indeed it actually does have liquid water in there using some magnetic techniques that we can look at that and most likely it's being heated up because of the interesting orbits that the, these moons have around the planet that causes it basically to crunch in such a way that it builds up friction and heats it up, makes thermal vents that are probably heating up the water. So if we burrow through the ice of Europa, maybe we'll just find bacteria, maybe we'll find fish of some sort. Not the fish that we know of, of course, but this is a possibility. We need to go and check it out as soon as we can. And of course we need to find the good old organic zone. Titan seems to be really good for that because it's just loaded with hydrocarbons. These are the places we want to go that we have a good chance of finding either life or putting a better restriction on the probability of life popping out so we can actually know with some reliability how many civilizations might actually be out there in the solar system. But we must continue to look. It takes eternal vigilance. Every one of you listening to my voice Tell the world, tell this to everybody, wherever they are. Watch the skies, everywhere. Keep looking, keep watching the skies. That's my presentation, thank you.
I have this Q&A time now, but let me first give you the first question. What was that the ending to? Come on, sci-fi fans. Can the Twilight Zone? No, much earlier. Like the um, Before that, The Thing from Another World, 1951, I believe, uh, which also then was remade by John Carpenter back in the 80s, where it became much more graphic and then much more awesome. It's a classic sci-fi movie, and that ending phrase is also considered like one of the top lines from all science fiction. Up there with like, Beam Me Up Sky, or, or Trabuli Go, where no one has gone before. Okay, so, uh, do you want to moderate the Q&A, or should I just... No, go ahead. Alright, throw up your hands and I'll try to be somewhat intelligent. Yes? You're talking about the Great Pyramid. I saw... Uh, Yes. Um, there is one geologist who has claimed that, Robert Shaw. Yeah. And he's pretty much alone on that. Okay. Uh, pretty much all the other Egyptologists, geologists have looked at it, and the erosion fits much better with the other uh, patterns. One of the things that caused the erosion, especially on the Sphinx, is that basically just like groundwater seeping into the rocks, and there's salt in these rocks, which causes it to kind of expand and chip things away. Uh, we can even see like during like the Hellenistic and the Roman period that they were actually building bricks on this thing to try to hold it together. It was falling apart even back then. But the erosion seems to be much more consistent with it just chipping away due to uh, chemical processes rather than from rain. But yeah, that is a common claim, but again, only one geologist has put that out and he's been somewhat notorious in his claims in general. Did you have a Oh, go for it. Uh, this basically just something I wanted to add about the Hebrew vision. Mm -hmm. the, the Hebrews, you know, they took over Canaan, and then they, they, went, they ended up in Babylon. And uh, part of this vision was looking at the Babylonian astrological mm -hmm. and, and uh, this astronomical uh, depictions. Mm -hmm. And he was supporting the reason his vision was so important, he was surprised that they basically had the same uh, religious foundations. He, he was describing something that he saw in Babylon, like a statue or something or some sort of, that uh, it was important because they thought these were people that would not have the same God, would not have the same uh, religious Well, uh, the, the Jewish religion was definitely influenced during from by the captivity period by the Babylonian aspects. Uh, the creation myth seems to be very much influenced by the creation myth of the Babylonians of Bardu coming along and splitting up a water monster to produce uh, the ground and the, uh, the sky dome, the firmament. It's actually even more clearly seen, not in Genesis, but in the book of Job, where God talks about how he beat up a giant uh, alligator or dragon, really, that can talk and spit fire and talk. Job is a weird one. Uh, so a lot of that connection is also because of influence upon the Jewish religion of that time. Uh, also a lot of influence from the Persians when they um, took down the Babylonian Empire uh, after uh, several decades of the Jews in captivity. And then they were influenced strongly by Zoroastrianism. So a lot of that syncretism is due to the fact that they were in that dominant culture. And it also makes sense then to use that sort of iconography. This is rather common to use the sort of myths and symbols of the dominant culture and to reformat them for your own uh, purposes, to your own ends. This is, uh, this is something that sociologists have studied fairly well. So I think a lot of that similarity can be established by the fact that the Jews are being, at this time, very much influenced by the dominant culture. Uh, may I jump to another person? I can come back and hear more. Yeah. Okay. All right, cool. Yes. Uh, all the way back, yes. All me. Yes. Uh, if you're looking at, like, Stonehenge, though, like, the Romans and the Egyptians are, like, really advanced civilizations, but during the time Stonehenge was built, they, uh, I don't think that was as advanced a civilization, so how they set up the rocks? 
Yes, that is true. This is actually um, a structure that is not formed by a, an advanced Bronze Age civilization. Um, and there's actually been a lot of work to try to figure out how exactly did they move the stones because they are fairly heavy. But basically, again, a lot of uh, human power instead of you know, force power. And the thing that helped them really upright themselves is the center of gravity of the really big pillars is actually not at the very center, but kind of tipped in. So you dig a hole, basically, in front of where the pillar is going to go. You push it. The center of gravity pulls, and then it shoots itself straight up. So just with a little bit of uh, forethought, you can actually get these things to stand up without having to actually loop them and put them into place. So there's still mystery in exactly how it was done. But it's a mystery because there's all sorts of theories of how it could have been done with that sort of tech. And so it's basically of trying to figure out which exact method did they do. It's the same sort of thing also with the Eastern Iron Island heads, uh, the uh, Moai, they're called, how exactly they were moved. Uh, the documentary I mentioned that was from PBS, they showed a method of how they were moved, which again, doesn't require aliens. But that particular strategy, they uh, thought it wasn't fitting the evidence as well, and so there's a newer hypothesis to try to explain the movement that fits um, the legends of the time and also the features of the stone that seem to make the more sense. So instead of them being dragged, they were kind of actually like walked along using ropes. So, yeah, one of the reasons we have so much mystery is because lack of written records or pictures to see exactly how they did it. Imaginations run wild, run wild, and they try out all the different ways. One of the interesting things I've actually seen with the, the Stonehenge rocks is that all around uh, this region of Great Britain, there are these almost, well, these really good spherical rocks. And it's uncertain what they're used for. And one of the hypotheses is they were ball bearings, effectively. Chiseled out to be spherical, you put them on a track, and then you can basically roll along the rocks on top of those. Um, it's been shown that it can work, but if it is the actual method, again, that's very debatable. So we have a lot of uncertainty, but it's also because we have a lot of ways they could have done it. Ah, uh, yes, the uh, the Baghdad battery, yes. Um, I put up my contact info because I've been doing a little bit of blogging about this as well, and I talked about the Baghdad battery. And from what I have gathered, there's actually no uh, scholarly published literature supporting that it actually was a battery. That some of the issues is the fact that um, the context it was found in, uh, there's actually multiple stories of how it was found. That always makes archaeologists go, okay, red flag. Uh, the materials that are kind of in there, they're somewhat speculated that they actually put um, an acidic liquid in there so that way you can act as an electrolyte. The acidic nature that's in there, that could be explained just by decaying papyri because it had nearly 2,000 years to decay, so it could explain that. Um, we don't see any knowledge of this in Persian or Arabic or Greek records about this sort of thing. We don't find things that you would need such as wires to connect them. So, and the features itself, like there's supposed to be an asphalt topper, but if you put that on top, you can't actually get to the um, voltage potential inside there when you put the topper on. So if there is an electric charge that you could get, you can't access it. So it seems more like it's due to uh, an historical book where it's possible that it could have been a battery, but it's not very probable. It doesn't seem to fit the context as far as we know. It looks like a regular jar that just got some rusty metal into it ultimately. And that's, as I understand, the, the more widely accepted um, belief about it. Yes? Um, you had talked about how biblical scholars rejected the story of Magi following the star. Um, what is their claim to, what's the reason for rejecting that? I don't know okay. if you went over that. I, I basically jumped over it saying, that's a consensus that I could make a talk out of it myself. Uh, because I've studied it for like half a decade now. I don't have a life, so that happens. <laughs> but a, a few highlight points. One, the timing of the story is in contradiction to that in Luke. Matthew places the birth of Jesus before the death of King Herod, who died in late 5, early 4 BCE. Luke says Jesus was born during a particular census that started in 6 or 7 AD. Can't be born of both, unless Jesus died and got resurrected to get killed and resurrected to yes. That theology I'm not familiar with. <laughs> but I would throw past you. So that's 
So there's that detail that the other record, and by the way, this is from the, Luke is the one who even claims he's actually being an historian. Contradicts in there, doesn't tell the Magi story, doesn't have any of the big things under Herod. So that makes things suspicious. Uh, the slaughter of the innocents that were supposed to happen under Matthew, this we find nowhere in the historical record. Even if just a couple babies had been killed, the idea that a king would have gone out to try to slaughter children because of an alleged uh, new king. And by the way, looking a whole lot like crazy Pharaoh, and Jewish historians are not making the connection to writing that down, very implausible, even if it's a small number. Uh, we also have to know from the archaeology that uh, the best indications is that probably Bethlehem didn't uh, exist at the time of Jesus. So, very hard to have a star of Bethlehem without a Bethlehem. Uh, there's also the supernatural aspects to it. Uh, the fact that if Magi had been coming from another nation to a Roman province to declare a different king, and the Roman Empire is just like, man, <laughs> yeah, you can, you, know, you can put whoever you want in charge of this place, even though we literally sent in an army so that King Herod could control this place. Yeah, these sorts of things add up and say, you know, this is rather implausible. And when you also look at it, that ultimately looks like Matthew's not even trying to tell history. That he looks like he's just trying to tell a story for theological and narrative purpose. We then have very little reason to think these events are true. All these things that Von Danica and Sukulos and others just get passed because they're basically biblical literalists in a tradition that died in the early 19th century. Where all the miracles of the Bible, they happen. But the primitives didn't quite understand it, so if we fix this or that, so Jesus wasn't walking on water, it was just a really misty day, and he was walking on the beach shore, and they got kind of confused. I'm not making this up. This was actually one of the big arguments back in 1830 for how Jesus walked on water. So, yeah, literally the ancient astronaut guys are stuck about 200 years in the past when it comes to Bible scholarship. Okay, um, did I get everything there you want? Mm -hmm. All right. That is true as well, that they're of a uh, late date of unknown authorship, that adds to the, the problem. And you have to ask the question, do we trust the Roman Council of Nicaea and Constantine's overseas? Um, it sounds like you're uh, bringing up the, uh, that the canon was basically formed under Constantine. That's actually not true. Okay. The, can the, uh, the canon, well, officially in some ways it actually was done even later, but only like after the Reformation, where it was officially canonized. But it effectively was in place sometime in the middle, late second century. Okay. Um, probably put together by one editor. Uh, it's been claimed we even know who the editor might have been, but it's, a little, it's really uncertain. But the time frame, mid late second century, <coughs> you basically have from Matthew Revelation that order. Uh, there's probably also some still some editing along the way before it got to how we know it and figuring out the exact original form is still something that is not certain. The best we can do is probably reconstruct that editor produced back in the late second century. So we may not know what original Matthew looked like before it got um, tightened up or added or subtracted. We know this happened, uh, for example, the Gospel of Mark um, ends at verse 8 of chapter 16. And sometime later on, somebody added 12 more verses. So that way, uh, people actually saw Jesus after he was resurrected. We have the manuscripts that don't have this ending. We have manuscripts with different endings. There's actually four different endings along with manuscripts without it at all. So we definitely know that editing happened, which again, makes us even less certain about any stories we happen to get from these books of unknown authors from unknown times who aren't even writing in a way that looks like they're trying to do history. So yeah, it all adds up and makes us really suspicious. Anyone else have any good questions? Yes? Uh, I was going to ask, um, I know that the amount of explanations we're discovering is increasing you know, very rapidly, and Kepler is doing great work in modeling like atmospheres based on the orbit and how close it is to the star that's orbiting the star system. We don't know how well we're able to, how well we're able to weed out the chemical content at this point of exoplanets. I know that's like a really specific question. But okay, so basically like the imaging of uh, exoplanet atmosphere. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, as I understand, that is. Um, right now at like the limits of our technology, which of course means 10 years from now, 
this might then become standard practice because we're advancing so quickly, as you mentioned. Um, I'm not too up on the exact limits right now, but I think we actually have been able to do some um, things when it comes to actually like monitoring a planetary atmosphere outside of our solar system. And also interestingly, they did some experiments recently during the transit of Venus that they pointed the Hubble telescope at the moon to look at Venus. All right, that sounds weird. But the reason they were doing that is that basically the moon acts as a mirror. Because the Hubble can't look directly that way because then it has the sun and then it just melts everything inside, bad day. But then having the light of the sun going through the Venus atmosphere, bouncing off the moon, coming back to the Hubble. And so then we can look at an atmosphere that best as we know at least, is dead, and see can we get false positives out of it. So we can then do some statistics that way. So if we actually do detect uh, carbon dioxide or methane in another atmosphere, we can say to what probability it's a real signal or it's artificial. So that's one of the things we're doing right now to help us advance when we actually have really good optics, but it's probably still decades down the road until we can do it uh, with any uh, preponderance. You don't think James Webb won't have it? Well, um, James Webb is still years away from launch, and that's if it doesn't have any more delays or cost overruns. It's already billions over, so it's it's going slow. I don't think they're planning on launching before 2018. Uh, it's been a bit of a mess, and it nearly got killed. And considering the way the Congress is going, who knows how that might go. So let that influence your vote. Vote <laughs> science. Uh, and I don't know how much James Webb is going to be designed for planet hunting. I'm not really sure it specs so much there. Though it's supposed to be looking at a larger wavelength batch than what Hubble does and with a larger view. So it's going to have really awesome optics, but I don't know how well it's set for planetary atmosphere. That's it's not in my domain of knowledge right now. Any else want to go? A good episode of Star Trek. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's an episode of Star Trek. Uh, For the world is hollow and I have touched the sky. That's the title. Uh, that's about as much credit as I'll give it. <laughs> that uh, the Earth, hollow Earth theory, if I remember correctly, is the idea that basically we're at the center of the Earth and all the sky is basically ultimately on the outer surface of some other feature. And whether it's because of government conspiracy, aliens, or just interesting geography, uh, probably depends on theorists and theorists. I don't know too much about it beyond its fictional counterpart, and it's probably on coast to coast on AM radio all the time. That's, I don't think that's what I was referring to. Oh, um, this is uh, uh, how the planet is before. Uh, that there's, uh, because of the magnetic pull from the sun, uh -huh. and, the, and the magnetic pull from the center of the Earth, that all matter would be from the outside, it's more of like a hollow skin in the orange. Okay. Um, all right, all right, I see. But it still sounds like the same sort of thing that some sort of sphere would develop around where all our hum all the humans are at, right? No. Yeah. Yeah. We're on the outside. Okay. Oh, I see. Um, that's a bit hard because, well, do you have an idea how strong the magnetic field of the Earth is? Well, take a kitchen magnet, and you'll see that if you drop it, it's not going to be hovering up or flying up. Gravity is beating it out very well. That refrigerator magnet has a stronger magnetic field than the Earth does. And also, magnetic fields don't really push on rocks unless they're full of metals like iron, nickel, nickel or coal. Uh, the Earth's crust is mostly um, silicate, so it's not really affected by magnetic fields. So there's no reason why it really should be pushed out by a magnetic field at all. Well, on the other hand, the force of gravity is significantly strong. So it seems like it has those major a priori reasons to doubt. And this is from someone who knows very little about geology. Just from my physics knowledge, that magnets aren't that strong, but I've noticed a lot in pseudoscience, pseudo-scholarship, whether it's perpetual motion machines or what, the word magnet is pretty much synonymous with magic. Magnets, how the hell do they work? <laughs>
I even see this also with ancient alien theorists. There's another site they'll go to called Nan Madu, which is in the uh, close, I think, to the Philippines. It's an interesting site. It actually was also H.P. Lovecraft's inspiration for a relay. It's an interesting structure. It's built, it's built up with a bunch of logs made out of basalt. And then they'll point, oh, the rocks are magnetic. Alien technology. Um, the basalts are magnetic because all basalts on Earth are magnetic. They picked up the magnetic field of the Earth. So again, it's weaker than a refrigerator magnet's field. So that's not too out of the ordinary. And when I see people that claim said the magnetic field there was there to push away hurricanes to protect the rice paddies. Again, take a refrigerator magnet, find a hurricane, see what happens. <laughs> Unfortunately, this is actually claimed. I was recently arguing with someone making this very claim. Apparently, you know, thought it was a conspiracy with 9-11 and what have you. It all gets wonderfully mixed together. I did. I told you, find a storm, take a, take a fridge bag, now see what happens. See if you push it away. Unless this magnetic storm happens to be constructed of ball bearings, it's not going to work. <laughs> Okay, uh, was that, did I answer that question already? Right? Yes. Okay, okay. All right, let's give them another round of applause.